happy um, that we record. Thank you very much. That's good. So recording has started, which is excellent. And uh, as usual, this is an interactive session. So if you would like to ask a question at any moment or any point, then please uh, raise a hand and we'll bring you in. Uh, we will open up the chat as well if people want to um, uh, make any comments in the chat or put any um, uh, links in the in, in the chat uh, and we'll uh, we'll try and get through that. So that's enough of the introductions. Uh, thanks for joining this morning. Really appreciate that. Uh, Mark, over to you first for annuities are back in vogue. Thanks, Steve, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's session, especially at the beginning of the, the short week. I'm conscious that we have not one, but two leading professors following me today, so I aim to be as brief as possible, enabling us to hear what they have to say ASAP. Um, you have to excuse any coughs or cracks in my voice as I started feeling a little bit unwell in the night. If I'm rambling and not making any sense, you know, everything's A-OK. -okay. If I start making sense, then we really need to start to worry. Um, the first time I was fortunate enough to speak on Pension Playpen, I used a platform to talk about annuity rates. I made several references to underwear and a childhood superhero called Captain Underpants. Uh, this time around, I'll be focusing on the annuity options whilst making several references to clothing and outfit accessories. Now, I know what you're thinking. What on earth do you know about fashion? Well, let me tell you, after Captain Underpants came a new hero of sorts, uh, and it was Derek Zoolander. Now, Derek Zoolander uh, came around in 2001 and he gave us the ultimate photo shoot look. Uh, look, sorry, it was called uh, Blue Steel, and it remains unrivaled to this very day. However, I can tell you, three years earlier, 10-year-old Mark Ormston produced this picture. Now, I'll let you be the judge, but I reckon I've got a claim on Blue Steel here. So you're in safe hands, you can sit back and relax, and we'll start with a Stella McCartney quote. A little black dress is something to rely on, to fill you with confidence and ease. Now, I don't know about you, but you can't hear or read a quote like that and not think, oh, blimey, annuities are the little black dress of pension income. It's so obvious. Just a little bit of a tweak and you get an annuity provides the policyholder with pension income they can rely on, providing a level of confidence and ease. So it's it's always been there, that, that analogy. It's always been staring us in the face. Now, just like the little black dress, annuities can be accessorised. They can have all sorts of options and glamorous things added to them to make them sparkle a little bit more. I'm going to focus on three of them. I'm going to focus on the, the popular choice, which is the guarantee period, the exclusive choice being value protection, and the hot topic of escalating annuities as we're in this inflation environment at the moment. So starting with guarantee periods. According to the FCA retirement income data, 80% of annuities purchased included a guarantee period. And to give you a little matching fashion, uh, fashion accessory tip, 80% of people wear heels with little black dresses. However, that percentage decreases during periods of dancing, as we are all well aware. Now, the cost of a guarantee period can vary, but the five year guarantee period is most commonly selected, in, in my opinion. And all the figures you're going to see on these slide decks today are based on a 70 year old with £50,000 being used to purchase the annuity. Annual income, there's just a difference of £45 a year between having no guarantee and a five year guarantee period. But when we look at that, over a lifetime, the average life expectancy for a 70 year old uh, female in the UK today is another 18 years. So to the age of 88, now I realise I'm using an average here, so some people will live longer, some people won't live as long. But the difference, uh, if we're looking over that average life expectancy, so those 18 years, it's just £810 over that life expectancy. Now that's not too bad, I don't think, for a benefit that's potentially worth a maximum of around £17,300. If we were going to look at the more extreme choices, so the maximum guarantee period being a 30 year guarantee period, you can see there's a much more substantial difference in that yearly income. It's actually £920 a year lower than having no guarantee. However, so over an average lifetime, sorry, that's that's the equivalent of about £16,500. That's a, a substantial hit for people. However, again, keeping with that average life expectancy, 
if someone was to die after 18 years, that means there's 12 more years of payments to be paid, totaling an additional £32,000 nearest uh, near, near enough. Uh, that makes the total uh, payout from a 30 year guarantee £79,500. And I can see how this can be quite appealing to those sort of people who are in essence, very risk averse and they're just looking at their annuity. But the key here is obviously that 32,000, that 31,800 is for the beneficiary. The annuitant's actually receiving 16,500 pounds less over their time if they were, like I say, they were to uh, die on the 88th birthday. So what's, what's the verdict on guarantee period? So in my view, it's a classic for a reason. The annuity plus guarantee period combination is a pension income staple and can be used for multiple occasions. It could be used on those lower guarantee years, so five years, 10 years to cover the worst case scenarios. They can also be used uh, to secure payments with beneficiaries after the policyholder's death, if we're going to look at those longer guarantee periods, so 20 years plus. Moving on rapidly, I'm going to look at value protection, which I, I referenced earlier as the exclusive choice. And the reason why I said that is that only 3% of annuities purchased, uh, according to the FCA data, included some sort of uh, level of value protection. And your, your matching fashion accessory fact here is that 3% of people take an umbrella on an evening out with them. However, the percentage of umbrellas that make it back home safely is considerably lower, which is something I'm sure we've all experienced at some time or another. Now, the cost of a value protection annuity or 100% value protection annuity is uh, around £560 a year based on this annuity shaping. And that's the difference of about £6,500 over the average lifetime. And that's the guarantee that at least the original investment is protected. So in this case, £50,000. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to compare the value protection with the guarantee period and see which one's sort of coming out on top. So the equivalent of the 100% value protection was actually a 16 year guarantee period. Now the 16 year guarantee period actually pays out higher income. It's not masses, but it's still 32 pounds a year higher. And if the annuitant was to die five years after the annuity was set up, the guarantee period's paying out higher income to the beneficiary. The same applies over 10 years and the same applies again over 15 years. So I'm really left with a, a bit of a harsh review of value protection at this moment in time. And I've sort of said here, is it time for this exclusive option to be made extinct? Do we want to be putting this in front of people if a guarantee period can provide higher annuity payments for the annuitant and potentially the beneficiary. And I've, I've uh, again, keeping with my fashion theme, the extra income could be used towards funding not only additional pina coladas, but of course those umbrellas that we've lost on the way home if we keep getting caught in the rain. And lastly, the escalating annuity payment. So 14% of annuities purchased include escalating annuity payments. And again, this is one uh, for people to be mindful of, 14% of people who have been asked to watch a bag are given any additional attention to the bag. So be careful who you're saying watch your bag to because we don't. And uh, that percentage decreases should foods or drink or anything else interesting happen around the table at that time. This is actually the most expensive of the annuity options in terms of yearly or starting yearly income, I should say. It's £954 um, a year difference between a level uh, annuity, so no escalation involved. And but obviously the three percent escalating annuity is going up every every year for over that 18 year period. Again, looking at the average life expectancy, making it a difference of only just over three thousand pounds. And that is obviously to help against the impact of inflation. And that's an important point, because when we're describing level versus escalating annuities to people, we often see graphs like this, which are lovely straight lines that just says your level annuity is this amount and it goes nice and flat and your escalating annuity will just grow in that lovely diagonal line. And we say your yearly income becomes higher than a level annuity um, around the 12th year and it will continue to grow. But this for me is a huge faux pas. It's up there with socks in sandals. It's not the point of the option. The point of the option was to help against the um, impacts of inflation. So what I've done here is I've tried to look at inflation rates 
over the last 18 year period to 2003 to 2021 and looking at the buying power and what's going on with that level versus escalating annuity. Now, again, we don't have uh, a huge amount of wiggle uh, in these lines. They're still fairly straight because of this low interest rate environment. So at Playpen, we've been trendsetters. We've been talking about the 70s last week. We're going to be talking a bit about the 70s again, potentially with the two professors later on. So I've said that flattish lines are out and giving the 70s. So I've recreated this graph based on the high inflation environments that we saw in 1970 through to 1988. And this would be the buying power of that level annuity if we saw the same um, levels of inflation uh, today. So not many straight lines going on here, big dips going up and up and down there. But when I was looking at this, it did sort of um, to, to mix up all my different analogies and metaphors was that it reminds me a bit like buying the car with the level annuity. You get it at a purchase price, but the second you purchase it, you're, you're not getting that value. It's depreciated immediately because there's going to be some sort of level of inflation, even if it's point something or other. Whereas with the S, um, the 3% escalating annuity, um, it's there to like sort of try and mitigate against these risks. And as you can see uh, with that pink line there, so the 3% escalating annuity payments, even in the the sort of the mid 70s, we were seeing really high inflation. It was still sort of dropping the buying power of the annuity, so it's still reducing. And there's still, but that said, when I look at the chart as a whole, there was five points. There was five years, so nearest a third of the time, the escalating annuity was providing a, a slight increase or maintaining where the level, the buying power of the level annuity was actually decreasing. So it sort of left me with quite a difficult verdict on escalating annuities, to be honest. I've put here that they cannot promise to provide higher total income. In fact, they cannot even promise to deliver higher income or yearly income in the mid to short term. However, they are there to provide a smoother journey. Or to put it another way, you have the outfit, you're looking great, but the shoes aren't the most Sorry. comfortable. Sorry, Steve. Mark. Mark, we lost you then a little bit. Um, right. If you just repeat that point. That's right. I was just saying, um, can you hear me a bit better now? I'll just turn my camera off. <laughs> have, we, have we lost Mark? Oh, there we go. Great. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Is that OK now? Um, and I was just saying, you know, do, do you go through the pain of uh, the inflation with the level annuity or do you go out and do you buy a bag big enough to carry your comfortable shoes uh, and to change into later on? I started with Stella McCartney. I'm going to end or to, towards the end with um, Coco Chanel. She says simplicity is the keynote of all true elegance. And Again, just a slight tweak. Simplicity is the key to annuity options. Steve um, mentioned last time I was on Playpen, you know, do people really understand five year guarantee periods, 10 year guarantee periods? What do they mean in practice to people? And I, I think he's right. I think if we've got things like value protection, overlap with proportion, it's just filling up a load of literature and confusion to customers. So we need to move away from this model. And I just wonder whether something like pension income defaults, the whole idea of flex first, fix later, or even retail CDC might present a golden opportunity for the annuity market to reinvent how it's looking at its options and presenting its options to the mass market. At the moment, we are sort of saying, here's the highest rate based on very little information. And if you want to add a, a partner, a spouse, some extra guarantees, your income's dropping, making people feel like something's being taken away from them. I think we need to get to the point where we're actually saying, okay, no, this is your objective and this is the annuity that's going to match those needs. So I think we just need to do a little bit of reverse engineering, but naturally we need a level of engagement to achieve that. Now, as I said, that's going to be nice and brief today uh, and I'm going to conclude my slides there. So like I said, we're going to the serious business with the two professors. Mark, that was really good. Thank you very much. Uh, Billy, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you just want to make a point, raise a question? Yeah, just just very quickly, very very good presentation. Um, with, with a lot of you know serious research on annuities and sort of two 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 bits. First of all, um, 
with the level V escalating, um, if um, people took a level annuity but didn't spend um, the difference between the level and the escalating and sort of put it in the bank, you know, they would end up, you know, better off. So escalation is very expensive. But I think a, a more important point is um, Chris Curry and his team at PPI did some some really good work and said that um, for people um, with more modest means, the state pension will take up the highest proportion of their retirement income, and that is by definition inflation linked. Therefore, it's quite logical for people um, to have level annuities um, because they, they 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 know. And, and I think the level of the escalation is 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 a really difficult one. Um, and and just a, a a very quick question, which you may know the answer. Do you know what the implied rate of inflation for um, an RPI annuity? When I last did the numbers, an RPI annuity was something like the equivalent of four and a half, you know, fixed. And 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 maybe in today's climate, you know, RPI annuities may come back in fashion. Yeah. So that last time I looked, Billy, it was it's around five five percent. Um, but they're all sort of perhaps now aren't they closer to, to sort of five percent uh in a way um and i think your point around the level annuity is very valid and the state pension in particular i think if we move into this uh area where we're buying the annuities later in life so we are looking at 70 75 80 then actually the the impact of inflation is probably not going to have quite so long to, to eat away at it anyway. Whereas if you're doing it earlier on, so you know your 60s, um, then I think then it matters a little bit more. But that, that's you know that's that's my personal view. And, and finally, I think a good link into the next presentation is you know the, the best way to hedge against inflation is in real assets. So you know maybe you know you have your level annuity and the other bit you put in drawdown and hope that you know the growth there will hedge against inflation. But anyway, thank you very much. I'll shut up now. Um, we've got a, a question regarding the uh, maximum term on the guarantee. Uh, Terry's very kindly said 30 years, and I think Canada Life will do 30 years, Mark. Uh, but Karen from LCP suggesting that might be unauthorized. Is there any clarification on that from you, Mark, or Karen, or somebody no, I'm happy. in that field? Uh, I guess. I'm out. Uh, my expert, this is Karen. Um, my expertise Hi, Karen. is much more DB than lifetime annuity based, and uh, okay. uh, I've been pointed at the uh, the edits that were made in 2015. I'm only seven years out of date. <laughs> but obviously, in the DB <laughs> world, we don't have guarantees longer than 10 years because they would be unauthorised. Yeah, and then that, that's my fault. This is Alan Smith here for asking the question because I spend most of my life in DB as well. So uh, I've learned something today. Thank you. Likewise. So there's no tax implication, Mark, for you know, 15, 20, 25 years, right? OK, cool. That's good. OK, that's good. OK, so that's um, that's good. Um, does anybody else have any questions um, at all on the wonderful world of annuities? I suppose the other thing, Mark, that we could just briefly say is the value of impaired annuities is always worth talking about uh, customers, clients, policyholders, health. Uh, there are some interesting rates out there, aren't there? Um, is that something you're seeing at the moment, Mark? Yeah, I, I very nearly talked about annuities without talking about rates. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Um, <laughs> and, but yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I think you know, as a 65-year-old, you, you're over. You know, it's close to sort of 6.3% on a standard conventional rate at the moment. Adds in some enhancements, some underwriting in there. I think we see an average of 12 to 14% uplift on that standard conventional rate. Um, and again, as as people age, so if you're purchasing that annuity in your 70, 75, 80, then actually you're, you're more likely to get that under underwritten annuity, and you're you're much looking uh, much looking to sort of especially around 80, you're getting close to double figures. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important point. Really important point. Okay, Mark, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, obviously, the chat room will remain open. That's really good. Uh, I can't see any other hands raised. Um, Stephen, um, sorry, Simon Glover, do you want to uh, move on to your presentation now? We'll introduce um, Professor Stephen Thomas and Professor Andrew Clare, and we'll move into the world of academia and efficiency in drawdown and all those wonderful things. So I'll get the uh, presentation up, but um, yep. um, Professor Steve is here, I believe. 
Um, so perhaps we could start off whilst I try and figure this out. Yeah. Um, so Steve, could you unmute and uh, we can introduce you? Is that possible or? Yeah. There we go. So can you hear me uh, now? we can hear you. Yeah. We can hear you. Yep, absolutely. Good. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Um, and um, uh, we really, really appreciate your your input. I know that uh, Simon's going to light up a um, a slideshow um, for you uh, and for Professor Claire. So uh, we'll we'll get that started. Um, so you you're, you have been involved for many many years in um, in uh, analysing this part of the sector, I guess. Uh, um, yeah. On this, Steve, what, what what what's your thoughts first about Mark's presentation? And well, I think before we I think start, it was fa fantastic slides, uh, well beyond the capability of a business school to produce. So congratulations, Mark. That was um, <laughs> that's something I'll take away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very entertaining and, and some great messaging. And that's a great good way to bring it in, actually, thanks, because, um, you know, Mark's talking about the uh, the consistency of the annuity income. And it, recently, the Australians, their super superannuation funds had a big survey and 70 percent of people wanted a blend. And that's the word they were using of both con consistent income like the annuity and market related investment income. So what I'm going to talk about, if you like, is the latter part to sit alongside the constant um, flow of income, which you have in some guaranteed form. Uh, and that's where the stories go. And there now, Andrew Clare, who's also on the call, um, he and I worked on this area for far too many years, uh, including we've now merged into deferred annuities. So we were particularly interested in combining the longevity protection with the market solutions for an investment strategy. We start, started our lives with investment strategies. And in fact, although we are sort of in the academia, um, we're sort of not as well, because what I'm going to talk about here and Andrew will be uh, chipping in is actually run by three investment funds, retail investment funds in London uh, at the moment. So it's very much um, an active, proper piece of working kit. And I think it's got a big message for everybody worried about investment strategy in retirement, because what we're saying is you all looked at the wrong descriptive statistics for performance in a retirement market fund. What you need to be worried about far more is not the wonderful things like sharp um, and volatility um, and return. What you really want to be worried about is how much you can lose the maximum drawdown. So I want to give you a few slides on that and hope to persuade you that that really should be the key statistic which is talked about in retirement investment solutions. So I got new glasses first time in my life. I'm going to have to put them on because I've rapidly got dependent upon them. OK. Um, we have here this concept of sequence risk, but before that, the William Sharp, who, as you well know, is a Nobel laureate and all that, um, I found out courtesy of Simon Glover, uh, thank you, Simon, that he actually said the single nastiest, hardest problem in finance is, is how much you can withdraw from a, a pension pot or a savings pot in retirement. But clearly, William Sharp found it so difficult that he withdrew and he decided to invent the capital asset pricing model because that was an easier piece of kit for him to worry about. So that's a first. I never realized he'd ever shown any interest. But also these great Nobel laureates in finance also have done very little in contributing to thinking about how we invest in decumulation. I think uh, Robert Merton's got uh, a piece, but it doesn't actually contribute to how should we structure an investment portfolio? Now, the way we go about it is that we came across uh, sequence risk in a different context, um, and we came across a concept called the perfect withdrawal amount from a fund. And that's basically if you knew what the returns over the period of decumulation were, what would be the annual amount you could take out between now and the conclusion of your fund? Um, and we call that the perfect withdrawal amount. Now, of course, you don't know what the returns are going to be, but you can do Monte Carlo and do other sorts of simulations and you can get a distribution of what it would be like. And then out of all that, we come out with a, a number for any given year of a perfect withdrawal rate. And we work with these perfect withdrawal rates. Now, that sounds mega sophisticated compared to that 
um, terrible concept of a 4% rule or similar, where I think a lot of the drawdown investment strategy story has gone around with playing with spreadsheets and what have you around these arbitrary numbers and then adjusting them for maybe a good year or a bad year. There's been relatively little, uh, shall we call it, finance science in there. So what is this sequence risk about? The sequence risk is about the order of returns. When's the last time anybody talked to you about the order of returns? Maybe the target date funds, but they're, they are pretty disastrous in terms of a risk that's uh, built into the order. But of course, you are familiar with the chart ratio. Now, when I ran a hedge fund for Bear Stearns, uh, we, we looked at chart ratios, but we also looked at maximum loss or maximum drawdown over a period of, say, 10 years of the history of returns of a particular strategy. And that's the first time I came about it. It was the early 2000s. And I began to realize that there was something in this maximum loss. The question was, how can we turn what you know about the maximum loss experience into a useful metric for choosing between funds, for instance, when it comes to the pensions environment? And the answer is quite simply, if we can smooth returns, reduce maximum loss, what does it do to the amount I can extract from my savings pot? And the answer is really simple. The smoother the returns, Notice I've not talked about total returns or risk or anything, but the smoother the returns, the more the client can get out over the lifetime of the savings pot. It's as simple as that. So how do we get a, a smooth uh, return? Well, this is where Andrew and I have been in the market over the last five, six, eight years even. We have three live investment funds, all based upon the same idea, which is to smooth returns. You can smooth it many ways. You could, you could actually use derivatives and lose a load of money. You could do active investment and try and anticipate market falls and get it wrong. Or you could do some simple arbitrary uh, I say arbitrary because you could use a range of smoothing techniques based upon technical analysis. So we won't argue about which one you should use, but the basic idea is you would use a smoothing rule like a 10-month moving average and go in and out of a risky asset and in and out of cash. Going in and out of cash for some of your assets is actually the cheapest option you'll ever get. You're not paying premiums for puts and calls, etc. You are simply parking some of your money in treasury bills. It's been around for hundreds of years. We've written dozens of papers on it, um, and there are free funds actually doing it. What we have here today is that if you use this movie, I'm going to show you that you can have a much better um, retirement experience in the risky asset world. You can hold more risky assets for longer, there's greater upside, and there's more protection on the downside. Most significantly, maximum loss is hit very bigly. If you go back one slide, please. That slide there shows exactly what's happening. If you took something like the uh, investment um, typical index of 2060 shares, um, that's the blue line. You can see, you know, it, it can't help itself. It collapses in 2002, 2008, 2020. We have, every 10 years, we have a massive, massive drawdown in conventional pensions portfolios. Look at the brown line, which is a, um, a simple five asset, um, multi-asset UK data. And what have we got? We've got a smoothed um, trend following type of environment. The maximum drawdown you get there is well under 10 percent throughout that historical period. Now, the significance of that, of course, is lost when you explain it to people. It's, oh, yes, but the blue lines bounce back. But the significance we show is that actually the blue line bouncing back is all very well. A, you don't know it's going to bounce back, of course, but also it does impact what you can take out in a decumulation sense. The key is we are bringing time into this discussion. When people just look, as I did at the hedge fund world, look at a 20-year performance, nobody talks about the order of returns. Nobody talks about accumulating additional payments because that actually matters as well, or decumulating withdrawals. Once you start having that in, then you start changing, what should I be looking at in the pension uh, performance world? And for those who know the statistics, we then show you what uh, the distribution looks like. Along the bottom axis, you can see the withdrawal rates, which are possible. 
up uh, on the vertical axis is the frequency of Vs and a range of portfolios along the bottom, 60, 40, 30, 70, multi-asset and then smoothed versions of all three. And the simple thing to look for is that the distributions move to the right. Once you smooth returns, withdrawal possibilities are enhanced, moving substantially to the right. And in fact, other work we've done, and this is a summary of what that uh, previous slide showed, we can actually increase people's pension withdrawals by 50%. Now, that's a great headline. We've written a paper with that. I then have to defend it. But what I'm really saying is that some of the points of the distribution, with and without the smoothed, the, the portfolio with the smoothed, you can take out 50% more per annum over the 20 year drawdown than if you're just doing, let's call it the long only 50 50 or 60 40. Smoothing is more important than diversifying. A long way. If, if we had more time, we would look at the multi asset version. It's in a published paper we can send you. And we show quite clearly. But simply smoothing an equity bond portfolio is much more important in enhancing withdrawal possibilities than worrying about other assets like property, like foreign bonds, like hedge funds, etc. They're, they're small players. They don't affect anything. What really does affect it is to get rid of the big drawdowns. Thanks, Simon. Uh, a quick example. Now, you see there are two friends of ours. And Mr. Lucky and Mrs. Unlucky. And what I want to show you is it doesn't matter when you were born. OK, when you smooth a portfolio, the withdrawal experiences are very similar. It doesn't matter if you if, if you start on a bad year or a good year. Here we have the savings part of half a million sterling, 60, 40 pensions portfolio. Our friends both draw an annual income of 25,000 a year. And you can see Therese has had a really bad time of it, bless her. Um, and this is before it got really bad for her. She retires at 2,000. Immediately, that portfolio takes a massive hit. And before you know it, she's struggling to, um, to keep her portfolio above water. The same portfolio. And Jeremy, being the lucky so-and-so he is, two years later, he retires. Exactly the same portfolio. And look, from the start, he just takes off like a magic. And he's going up into the clouds with his wealth. Um, sequence risk in action. Sequence. But how can we cure that? Really simple. How about I simply trend adjust both of those uh, equity and bond returns? Now they start, of course, two years difference as before. But look where they both. They, all, they both experience that wonderful upward movement taking the same amount out, 25,000 a year, et cetera. The point is we've removed the sequence risk from the um, Teresa's portfolio um, and Jeremy's have gone exactly in parallel. It didn't matter when you're born, which is the key here to when they started. And it's basically getting rid of sequence risk. Now, there's no measures of sequence risk. The industries haven't produced. Simon, Andrew and I have written a paper with a measure of sequence risk in the Journal of Retirement. Um, it's not standard usage yet. But I think all you need to really worry about is making sure you avoid the big losses. You don't need to worry about the performance necessarily of a fund, except worrying about excluding the big losses. And here we have the fund that we've been working with Simon on the last few years, um, the uh, AB Lifetime Portfolio. You can see what's happening there. The, the big drawdowns in the market of a green, um, the fund is getting you smoothed nicely out of big drawdowns. You then join in the upward drift and you again towards the end, uh, you, you're moving into cash. Moving into cash is the cheapest option you'll ever get. And it will allow you and your clients to take out substantially more withdrawals over a longer period. So this is what we're sort of saying. OK, we need deferred annuities or we need the guaranteed annuities of Mark. But in the market um, part of your solution, by all means, it doesn't matter too much the asset allocation. What does it matter is to avoid the maximum big drawdowns. And here we have Andrew's Andrew's 100 plus papers are available on the website there. And those are the two main ones we've drawn on today in our presentation. So I think that's all I've got to say. Uh, Andrew's on the call, so I know he'll be keen to, to tell me where I've gone wrong. No, as far as I can tell, you didn't go wrong at all, Steve. Thank you. I'm I'm only here to answer very simple questions. Let's make that clear <laughs> from the start. 
that was a <clears throat> very powerful presentation there, Steve. And <clears throat> Andrew, I'm sure a lot of our um, <clears throat> um, Playpen members will be very interested in expanding on the concept of smoothing. The message that, you know, the smoothing seems to have come across where you effectively take out the Big Dipper. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, for the non-academics, including me, um, in reality, how does that actually work? What, what um, you say you move to cash, when do you know how to move to cash? What's the timing issues? Uh, that's my okay. first question. Thanks, Steve. That's, that's a key question, of course. Um, and what we what we have, and and Simon actually has one in operation in his fund. We we've experimented with lots of frequencies of making decisions and what have you. Um, typically, there'll be a monthly decision, end of a month, compare say the S and P 500 index with its last one year or ten month moving average. And if it's in an upward trend, then we would say stay in the risky asset for that percentage of a fund. And if it's moved into a negative, we would put that into a, into cash or something similar. Now that sounds extraordinarily simple, but then we are simple folk and it works. And it works over very long periods of time. It's worked for many of the top hedge fund guys over 200 years. Um, I guess what we, we came into this by having previously run a hedge fund, which was super active every few seconds, we were changing things and then realizing that we never got anywhere with it and investors went bust. We didn't cause it, but we were there when it went bust. Then I thought there must be something better in terms of an investment strategy and an investment strategy which doesn't overreact, which doesn't make lots of false moves and what have you. And this slow moving, we, it is relatively slow moving. As you can imagine, we've tried every frequency under the sun and we've come back to this looking at data every month, looking at a simple rule, understanding sometimes it will go wrong, but over the longer periods of time it will go right. But then the question came, it's not just about investment performance. Clearly, there are, people are always going to shoot the lights out in invest. When you're trying to sell an investment fund, you need a period of brilliance, even if it's followed by terrible results, because you can sell when the result when you've got uh, good things going on. There must be a better reason, and the better reason is the withdrawals. Withdrawals are better, bigger, more consistent for the life of the decumulation when you have a strategy which doesn't have big drawdowns. OK, good. Uh, good answer, uh, Stephen. That's excellent. Um, Stephen Lowe has put a question. Look, Stephen, do you want to ask your question about um, Milliman? Hi, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Yeah, uh, Milliman did a piece of work um, a few years ago which looked at um, viewing annuities as an asset class uh, and replacing bonds or some bonds in a classic 60-40 portfolio used by financial advisors. And it showed that um, over the longer term, um, you could generate a more sustainable plan and by that your income would last for longer or indeed you could generate high death benefits. I was just wondering as part of your papers and research whether or not you'd taken bond switching and replacing with annuities as part of your analysis. Well, the work I've done separate from Andrew involves the deferred annuities as an asset. Um, and jointly deciding with bonds and equities. So the answer to that is in the context of deferred annuities, yes, not in the context of present annuities. But I think the work is going to move in that direction simply because the most recent paper written on this, um, we quote the Australians who say, you know, look, blended is the way it has to be. You have to think the client actually wants an element of market based return and an element of consistent guaranteed return. And obviously annuity. I think we've I lost think we've, Steve there. We've lost Steve there, yeah. Uh, Andrew, can you step in there or? Um, uh, so actually separately from Steve, I've also worked on deferred annuities. Um, and, and we both see from a separate perspective that there is some value in combining um, market-based solutions with with deferred annuities. Um, of course, uh, the, when def, when do you want deferred annuities to kick in? You know, majorly, it's probably when you're probably too old and too tired to to, to monitor your investment portfolio any uh, anymore. But there's a whole series of papers that are in the um, Financial Analyst Journal about seven or eight years ago now, at least, where they were suggesting you know, purchasing 
deferred annuities kick in at around about the age of 80, but staying invested in risky assets, at least a proportion up until that point. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Well, I think it, I think it does to to a great extent. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, um, you know very uh, very interesting. Um, Gareth Morgan, could smoothing be applied by individuals? Um, Andrew, what do you think on that? Do you think that uh, these funds are they available in the retail space for individuals or? Uh, well, yeah. Not? So, uh, so the funds that Steve's referred to are retail-based funds, so they are available. But I think perhaps Gareth was referring to an individual doing this, right. um, and my answer to him was a, you know, more efficient at the fund level. I think, you know, ETFs have given a given us a wide range of asset classes that we can play with now as individual investors. Um, but even so, you know, when you're switching, even rel- relatively infrequently, the transaction costs do build up. So. Yes, an individual could do it, but you'd probably want a reasonable uh, amount of money um, to start with. And it's probably still more efficient to find a fund that does it uh, does it for you, I guess. Well, I was going to say, Andrew, that on this call, we have a number of uh, master trusts, um, leading master trusts in the UK and a number of GPP providers. Um, I mean, this sort of stuff is actually amazingly interesting. Um, and is there a responsibility on the providers to start really analysing your research? Because I think, you know, if you know, we always talk about the gap between consumers and providers, but actually, you know, I think consumers want that type of fund. Why, why yeah. are we as an industry not actually wholeheartedly offering it as even as a choice, let alone offering it at all? Um, what, what's your thoughts there, Andrew? Well, first of all, declare of a conflict of interest, because I'd say, yes, they should be looking at it um, because it's what we've been researching for 10 years. <laughs> but yeah. but I do think, it, you know, the, the master trust suggestion is a very good one. That's the sort of framework, uh, Gareth, where, you know, these sort of strategies and uh, there are others uh, that are around there, too, which, you know, could be employed. Um, and they, you know, some of the large master trusts certainly have the scale and the efficiency and the skill to do something like that. Um, Nobody wants to put off uh, their members from saving for a pension um, because, you know, other members have lost loads of money um, before they got to actually retire. So, you know, keeping that maximum loss down is really quite important. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, Henry, you've got your hand raised. What would you like to say, Henry? Um, Yeah, I'd like to say something about, not say something, but ask Mark and, and Andrew and Stephen, question about distribution which touches on what we're talking about uh mark you're running an operation which at the moment can't recommend funds i'm led to believe because you're not fca authorized and there is this uh problem with investment pathways uh generally which is that they offer solutions but very little guidance whereas those people in a position to give guidance like mark yeah, can't offer complete solutions. Um, and nobody uh, in the FCA or TPR has really focused yet on the distribution of fund based investments or annuity based products uh, properly. So people are buying blind and often blind to the advantages of using the kind of services that Mark offers. So really, the question first to Mark and then to Andrew and Stephen is, how do we create a better buying experience for users of uh, pensions, savers, in other words? Mark. I'll let Mark go first. Yeah, no, it's a, <clears throat> it's a really good question. I, I think the, I think part of the issue for me is, is in the question, actually. We don't need them to buy anything. I think that's the key, isn't it? We we don't need them to buy products. I don't think we're in. We've also enrolled them now into the pension, so that they've got it. I think how do we then turn that into, you know, your phrase, Henry, into a wage for for life, or uh, you know, a pension income for life? And I think that's just actually all about the support that we need to start giving them, giving people an investment pathway, is falling a little bit short of that support. Uh, whereas I think we need to actually, I know people like uh, Baroness Oldman doesn't like the words, but for me, we need these sort of defaults, these sort of do it for me. Um, I've always been a big fan of the, the Nest Blueprint, which is, you know, back in what, 2015, 2014 now. And that, that's in essence 
you know, draw down lead and, and having a bit of a deferred annuity there. Um, I think that works great. Um, I think personally as well, we might go down the Australian model in five years' time. I think we might have a, a retirement infant convent and I think that might be put on trustees. But that, that's my that's my immediate thoughts. Thanks. Uh, just, just to add from my yeah. perspective, I think, uh, I think you know, the master trust framework is where this probably should happen. And um, I don't know if it's possible yet. And I don't know sh sure if that's what Mark was referring to, but, you know, it should be, uh, you know, uh, people should be able to join any master trust they like. An individual doesn't really matter uh, because that's where you get the scale and the efficiency and the skill and people as you know, should be the default funds doing this for people or the default strategies um, and we as individuals shouldn't have to worry about um, whether we're how to smooth our returns and so on. Um, but I do think the master trust gives us a fantastic as a framework gives us a fantastic, fantastic opportunity to offer uh, a better experience for retirees and for savers before they get there too. Yeah, absolutely. No, I um, totally get that. Um, we did have Adrian um, on. Um, don't know if Danny's still on, but uh, yeah, I mean, is there a responsibility, do we think, for master trusts to step up to the plate and really, really take on board this, um, well, I think amazing research, really, that, you know, we need to look after members and smooth it out. And uh, do we think that's uh, something that master trust should embrace? And where does it leave us um, on things like master trust committed to net zero, for example, ESG net zero? Um, any, any thoughts on that, Andrew or Steve, on, you know, this can be achieved with ESG bent as well or, or not? Uh, at, at, at scale, no, because the world isn't at net zero yet. So, you know, but you probably could find some funds which are have an ESG tilt. And as long as you can apply the trend following filter to those funds, then yes, you, you could do that. But, um, you know, that's the big problem with ESG. There's not enough companies out there which are currently net zero for us to really make net zero um, investments in aggregate. But, you know, it could be OK for some, could be possible for some to do it. Yeah, OK. And the other thing, obviously, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sort of stealing the limelight a bit. But the other thing is that Mark mentioned CDC. How does smoothing work in a CDC world? Um, is that something that uh, can help and or hinder? Um, I'm not sure I really understand fully CDC, but um, as long as there's a collective um, as long as there's a, an organisation overseeing the collective um, investment strategy, I don't see why not. But I could be wrong. Henry, what do you think? Do you think CDC, the smoothing fund is fully well, I, I, applicable in CDC? Mark Johnson just gave an excellent talk a few months ago where he talked about smoothing either being done on an algorithmic basis or on a with profits basis, depending on how much discretion you wanted to give an actuary. And uh, he, he made the same points uh, as Andrew and Stephen are making, which is that sequencing risk is is something we've got to consider. Uh, but he also made the point that if you want to have uh, long term growth on your money, you've got to get into the markets. That's how you get ESG in as well, by the way, because there's not a lot going on in the green bond market. Um, certainly not as far as green gilts are concerned, as far as I can see. Um, but the, the, the key thing about a CDC fund is it's got to have some kind of self annuitization properties to take out of the picture the problem that Stephen was talking about, Bill Sharp's nastiest, hardest problem, finance. And that can be done if you can get to a reasonable amount of scale. They were talking at just about 20,000 lives where you can actually self insure uh, and mortality is basically uh, dealt with within the funds. So new people come in, old people die, units fall back into the fund, new people benefit from old people dying. All those kind of ideas which are prevalent in annuities are just replicated. And you can also have the sort of under, underwriting of risk at outset where you look at the state of health of people and so on. So uh, that, that to me strikes me as the way CDC becomes a contract based concept. That was the way it was explained to us. 
Um, I'd be interested in Mark's views and, and Andrew's views and, and, and uh, Stephen's view on whether that's a practical possibility to overlay on the kind of fund that you've been talking about today. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the trend following filter that we've suggested could be uh, overlaid onto almost anything, really. Um, and that there's a question from someone in the chat there. How does a with profit solution for a drawdown compare with funds described in Andrew Stevens presentation? Well, my understanding of, of the sort of with profits world, having worked at LNG at a time when just about the time when with profits was becoming very unfashionable. With profits then was about the actuary making assumptions about what the asset classes were going to return and then working out what number they could afford to pay out on that basis. Um, ours is, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't combine that thought with our strategy, but our strategy is much more uh, about the investments themselves rather than the projection of, of where those investments are going to go in the future. So in other words, an, an actual organisation could make assumptions about investments run the way we suggesting or investments or the way other people suggest them they are run so i don't think they're mutually exclusive i think they can be combined um but that in answer to i think it was uh, i can't see now Martin, it's answered russell's question or um, that's that's the difference between what we're doing ours is a strategy an investment strategy whereas with profits is more a sort of forward looking um uh, uh, view of what can be afforded, uh, which you you know the actuaries would do once a year in a, in a with profits fund. Yeah. Your your okay. approach is close to what he called an algorithmic approach, where there was a formula applied to the yes. way in which assets are allocated. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Cool. Okay, we've got a hand from Esther Hawley. Do you, Esther, do you want to ask your question? Hello, yes. So I think there's a general feeling that, you know, some combination of drawdown along the lines of what we've been talking about today with an annuity or deferred annuity later in life is actually a pretty good solution for a lot of people in retirement. Talking about how master trust would be an ideal sort of framework for delivering some of those thoughts. Of course, one of the major challenges of having a sort of a default for members who've been auto enrolled into master trusts is that element of making a choice to buy an annuity. So my question I think is to, to Mark mainly is to say, can we press back into service your concept of the, the value protection, have 100% value protection, and then make the annuity surrenderable within the period that the protection applies, which would then allow you to default people into something and allow them an, an avenue to back out if they don't like it? Yeah, so it's a good question, thank you. Um, so if I had the time today, I, I would have gone into fi fixed term annuities, actually, because uh, you can do that through, uh, I know one provider will offer that through trust trust basis as well. And that's actually where I see the fixed term, um, uh, fixed term annuities market growing. Uh, they need to go into the master trust space. And that way, in essence, uh, at the moment, my understanding is the master trust world has gone down the pot based approach, which goes to this is for your reigning day, this is for your annuity when you get to 80, this is your, your active if you, you're withdrawing, etc. Actually, if you had a fixed term annuity underlining, um, have a little bit sitting in there that then matures at, say, age 80, for example, if death was to occur, you've got all the all the pension beneficiaries there um, and value protection built into the product already, so you don't need to incur any additional costs. And I think that's a it's a really good way of doing it. And of course, with a fixed term annuity, you can take a little bit of income as well. So we're talking about blending of having a little bit of secure income on top of the, the investment growth and or potential investment growth with drawdown. Fixed term annuity is another really nice way of doing that for those really risk averse retirees. Just use a fixed term annuity for your income, uh, whilst again having investment exposure through uh, a drawdown product on top. Thanks, Mark. Excellent. Um, and any other questions? Uh, I'll just double check the chat. Um, do we? Well, I mean. Do we really think with profit, going back to with profits, Andrew, just very, very quickly, do we really think we should go? I mean, it feels like from the industry insiders, should we go back to with profits? Uh, I mean, I hear that the PRU are making waves in some sort of fund in that ilk, but surely it we does. remember the noughties and the and the and the tens where with profits came out of favour. Yeah, I think 
the concept of with profits that you're giving people this smooth return i think is absolutely fine but i think probably the way it was done and that's why a lot of um, insurance companies came unstuck because yeah, they were still assuming they just assumed that equities were given eight percent a year more or less into perpetuity and then of course the high-tech bubble collapse of the early 2000s pushed you know pushed some of those insurers um uh you, you know to the brink um so I would say the principle of providing a smooth um, income stream, that's what an annuity does. Um, that's what we are suggesting you need to do. Uh, and, and that's what a, with Profits Fund does, I think is, is fine. But I think probably we've moved on from um, the way they were operating in the early 2000s. I, I certainly wouldn't invest in a with Profits Fund run on those along those lines. Um, others might, I suppose. Yeah, and actually one other thing, uh, Andrew or Steve, is there was a comment regarding target date funds. Um, and you've got people in the industry uh, who offer, you know, uh, target date funds and or, uh, I mean, one of them offers retirement bridge funds, they're called. But um, is there something wrong with those funds? Is it so the, 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 there, there isn't smoothing, basically? That's your problem with target date funds, is it? Yeah, I, I don't know where, where the Steve's deal here. I, I think Steve's particularly yeah. um, exercised here, yeah. by yeah. target date funds, I think. There's been some very bad experience, I think, in the US, Steve, in particular, haven't there? So basically, is it something like half of US savings goes into target date funds still, despite the disasters of 2009-10? Because people didn't realise the target date still had 50% equities and the percentage of total risk was still some huge number, like 80 to 90. Reducing the percentage of equities, I think, is now, we're finding, is not the way to go towards the final point. The percentage of equities is still doing you a lot of favours. People live a long time after 65. There's a number of equity cycles. The equity risk premium you're going to earn is actually more than compensating for the uh, the risk of being in the fund for another 20 years or 25 years. But that's there's a lot of people finding that all around the world now. Stay in equities as long as possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Henry. Henry, you got your hand raised again. Have you got another question? Or? Yeah, I'd just like to warn against the use of the phrase with profits. I hate it. And I agree that it gives people the wrong impression and it's misleading. Uh, the <laughs> idea is being bandied about by people like just use with profits as a reference point. But in fact, it's not with profits because with profits does provide some kind of fundamental guarantee. And there is an insurance company standing behind the that guarantee. Uh, and ha that has to be uh, provided for via solvency and so on. Whereas the idea behind a CDC fund is that the smoothing is done within the fund. It's done either on a discretionary, which is probably a better word for it, basis, e.g. with profits basis, if you have to use that term, or it's done on an algorithmic basis. But either way, somebody has to determine what's going on and be able to explain how they're going about things or else it's a non-starter because one thing we cannot go back to is the black box approach where nobody knows what's going on and then when things go wrong people get really pissed off yeah absolutely yeah totally agree <clears throat> uh Stephen and andrew that was absolutely fantastic uh, are you happy for that slideshow to be circulated to anybody who wants it or um are you happy with that yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect. OK, that's good. Uh, and as uh, as we said at the beginning, this is being recorded for people that couldn't join today. But no, honestly, that was a really, really interesting presentation. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we should all listen. Uh, we've got trustees on here as well. Morning, Nick. Um, and, uh, you know, trustees should listen as well in their space as to, you know, the impact of how to invest and smoothing, I think, a prize across the board, uh, as we've said. So fantastic presentation. It's opened my eyes to a few very interesting theme. So that's really, really good. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so uh, brilliant stuff. Uh, I really, really appreciate your time, Andrew and uh, and Steve. Uh, really appreciate your input. If anybody does want that, please contact me, direct message me in Playpen or email me uh, individually and I'll send you a copy of the slideshow. And thanks also to Mark. Again, Mark, fantastic. I love the pictures. Um, so, uh, you know, great, uh, great presentation with you, Mark. Um, next week, we have got Sir Steve Webb um, talking about state pensions um, and Mothers Missing Millions is going to be headline. Mothers Missing Millions. That's his headline, not mine. Um, but I hope you can join us next week for Steve Webb. Uh, if you uh, if you like Playpen and you're not a member, please join. 
uh, if you are a Playpen member and you like what we're doing, then please invite others to join on the Invite Friends tab. And as usual, um, we um, want to pray for peace in the East. And uh, we hope everybody has a fantastic um, rest of the day and fantastic rest of the week. Um, but uh, that's been a brilliant session. Uh, thanks again to Mark, Stephen and Andrew uh, and quite a few requests coming in for the slide. So um, if you could send those over, that'd be brilliant. So brilliant, brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we will see you all hopefully next week with Steve Webb and uh, enjoy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, Mark. Thank you. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.